ask you this though. So now yeah. I almost feel like we need to pour one out for for the Paul George era, five years. Uh, sure. In with the Clippers. So now that it's practically said and done, the price for George was Shea Gilchrist Alexander, which. Woof. Uh, Danilo Gallinari was at that point, as the kids might remember, a solid player. Uh, five first, two swaps. Now, on the face of it, the, the picks actually don't seem that extreme because everyone has followed suit and paid pretty much the same price for it. We got the Mikhail Bridges deal pretty recently. That's a pretty similar package uh, in terms of picks. Shea obviously swings it completely the other direction because he's uh, uh, in his prime 20-something MVP candidate. Uh, does this now seem like one of the worst deals of all time considering that you only got those precious five years with Paul George? I feel like this was going to be the window. I, I, you know, I didn't see the Paul George Kawhi thing as being the Clippers forever and ever so much as here's a concrete window of contention. They kind of got that but also they were just kind of hurt the whole time. And this is where, obviously knowing everything we know now, in particular about Shea, you don't do that deal as constructed. That would be ridiculous. But isn't Shea living kind of almost the best version of his basketball trajectory from that point? I, I know I didn't expect him to become an MVP. Clearly the Clippers Rob, didn't expect him to become an MVP. Nobody expected him to become an MVP guy. For sure. Finished second in MVP. Nobody thought this at the... T- nobody. So for him to get to this point, is an incredible turn, an incredible achievement, not something that anyone could have banked on. And so I understand, even in retrospect, why the Clippers rolled the dice the way they did. It's just, in the long view of history, it's going to look terrible. Because and Shea let's is not forget, good. it was Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. Yes. At the time, all the reporting was that Kawhi Leonard told them, go out and do a deal or else I'm going to sign with the Lakers. And I know there's people that's like, oh, he would have never played with LeBron and blah, blah, blah. He's not a coward. Blah. It was just leverage. Whatever. That's what he told the Clippers. So they did that deal because that's what it took to get Kawhi Leonard coming off of a finals MVP where this guy looked superhuman, okay? Like, it was it was a no-brainer at the time. Like, there was nobody arguing the idea. First of all, because they quote-unquote stole him from the Lakers, everybody loved that. It was all oh, Lakers incompetence, all oh, Lakers blah, blah, blah. Like, they were kid- everybody loved that part of it. And then again, you know, these two incredible perimeter players who at the time... Everybody thought were, you know, basically two of the best perimeter guys in the league. Paul George himself was coming off of finishing third in the MVP voting that year. Yeah. Like, that's the guy that they went out and got. That'd be like trading for Luka or something right now, okay? Like, uh, I, man, let's ease up I'm maybe a little I'm just saying, bit, he's the but, third, yeah, he was the third sure. MVP candidate this Not year. Not all third MVP candidates are I, created equal. Okay, cool. what I'm saying. I'm just saying, like, at the time... This it was it was obvious that they should have done this yeah. like obvious and you know for most of that first season specifically everybody just knew the clippers were going to win the championship every single media person you talk to everybody was just like oh the clippers are unbeatable the clippers are unstoppable i mean marcus more oh my god they added marcus <laughs> morris it I was forgot about bro morris. that's what it was i know it's like it's it's in the past but i remember this moment because i was up there damn near every single game and boy if the clippers management wasn't the most cocksure people i'd ever seen in my life dude they were so satisfied with themselves. And I think, you know, that regular season before the pandemic, they did look like legitimately the best team in the NBA. They looked dominant. Everything was working perfectly as if they designed it. And then, you know, what 3-1 lead got yeah. <laughs> squandered. Kawhi Leonard damn near never finishes another playoff series. It's just, you know, it is what it is. So one of the worst deals in, in NBA history. <laughs> I, I, I think we could all agree. Well, who do we want to be? Like, do we want to be the people who judge the trade now or the judge the trade on the night in the logic of that moment? Because I think in the moment, it's, Roz is right. A plus. In retrospect, C minus C, given the, given the outcomes that we know to be true. 
Yeah, I, th- I think, yes, I think a lot of people praise what they did. And I think if you were to bring us back to that time, they still do that. Although I will say there was some quibbling, including in terms in like the building with the Clippers about whether or not they were paying too much to get there. And like, if you were to look back and say, like, what was kind of the defining error of the Kawhi Paul George era? Uh, it was kind of like bending over backward for stars that in a way that like really compromise how the team was run and doing so in a way that like even like most franchises wouldn't. And then obviously that extends to their ability to handle injuries and like how they approach the, all of that. And so like there's that aspect to it too, but man, let me, let me say, I don't this. know when you lose, you almost always lose ugly. And it almost always looks bad in retrospect. What you gave up to get where you are if you can't punch it all the way through the title. And the Clippers didn't really get close very often. It's going to look ugly. But look at the Knicks trading for Mikael Bridges. That's a lot to give up for Mikael Bridges. But guess what? You get a great player. The Sixers are about to commit a ton of money to Paul George. The, the exact centerpiece of this Clippers team with all of his injury history, even older, five years older now than he was when he joined the Clippers. But you get Paul George and you get to contend. And so you have to give up to play at this level. And sometimes you can't even deliver on those terms. But I just think whenever you lose, whenever the the bottom on your team falls out, whether you're the Clippers who never quite got there, whether you're the Warriors who are kind of imploding with their, you know, historic core before our very eyes, it always kind of goes ugly. Well, now that it seems like the Sixers have Paul George uh, we don't know for sure, but it seems like they are, in air quotes, the strong front runners. This seems pretty f- fantastic. I'm uh, quietly the Celtics. It was reported that Christoph Porzingis might be out until next year, like the calendar year 2025. Snakes. And while they still have clearly a lot in order to get by in in the interim, I can't remember a guy who missed half a season and then was just gangbusters from there on out and the team like really made a go of it as a result of that. So I'm like increasingly worried about their next season. And so the door is kind of open in the East. I mean, we could talk about the Knicks with bridges and and whatnot, but I kind of think like as long as everyone's healthy, which is a big if, and it's probably one of the things we should talk about with the Paul George and Embiid combo, Mm -hmm. as opposed to Paul George and Kawhi. But like if this works pretty nice, extremely nice. Let's say this about the Celtics though. They're coming in with a 14-game cushion over second place in the East based on what they had last season. They just won a title without Chris Porzingis being anywhere near functional. So if he's even mobile by the end of whatever their season is next year, I think they're going to be pretty freaking good. Now, can they they get through the regular season? Well, they have to because Al Horford's not playing 48. (laughs) We know that. So in Kate the is coming they might back. Need, yeah. O'Shea Brissett might have to play big minutes if he returns. Like they're gonna need bodies to play the five or a way to fill those minutes to alleviate the fact that Porzingis isn't gonna be there. But yeah, to to your ultimate point here, not only is the East overall gonna be tougher next year, but it's gonna be tougher on Bigs. It's gonna be tougher if you are Chris Epps Porzingis. You're gonna have to deal with Joel Embiid with a reloaded team, with Giannis coming at you with probably an improved team in Milwaukee, with the Knicks being better and more versatile than ever before and pulling you into the pick and roll and slicing and dicing you that way. So it's it's looking like a much more formidable conference for sure. They so seamlessly integrated Chris Stapps those first two games into what they were doing after, like in the NBA finals, y'all. Um, I'm just not that worried about it. Like, if he comes back and he's reasonably healthy, they don't need him to play the whole regular season. They could run up a great record um, without the guy. I I don't think – I'm not worried about that. The Celtics should be the favorites to come out of the East next year. They're the freaking gems. Um, But, yeah, the Sixers – I think are better than they were last year. Obviously, it feels like they've completely upgraded um, in in a way that's like all the things that we've, you know, sort of derided uh, Tobias Harris for never having done (laughs) in his role as the third guy in Philly. Like Paul George is going to be so much better at all of that stuff, at the shooting, at 
the one-on-one shot creation, just the defense, all of it. The, the defense, playmaking. everything is yeah. just so much better um, with Paul George in there. But again, as Justin mentioned, this is a guy who, he's no Iron Man. He's not Mikael Bridges playing 83 games in a season, right? Like, this guy is very often hurt. Joel Embiid's injury pass is well-documented at this point. Uh, but when they're right, they should feel like they have a gr- as great a chance as anybody in the NBA to beat the Celtics next year. And listen, the Sixers, if they do indeed get Paul George, are now a big three. And if you look across the NBA, teams with big threes are having a lot of difficulty working in those fourth or fifth or sixth or seventh or eighth or ninth guys. And so the the Sixers are going to be limited to what they could add around these guys. They also added Andre Drummond, two years, 10 plus million. I actually like that deal. I think he's like a perfectly credible backup for Embiid. And as we've seen, Embiid needs one of those guys to, to spell him when he misses his inevitable 20 or so games. Uh, and then they also signed Eric Gordon because God forbid they don't sign a former Rocket. But like... The margins, it seems like, matter more in the NBA, as we're seeing. The Celtics being lock solid from one through seven made a huge difference. The Nuggets, it goes on and on. The Wolves, it's just teams are deeper and, and just better throughout the roster. And so it's going to be interesting because the Sixers are now a pivot to that, and they are led by two guys who are going to miss games. So those seams will show perhaps more than they would for three supremely healthy guys. And they're also going to have to replace everybody else, right? It would be one thing if you had these other kind of load-bearing pillars of your lineup, but what's going to happen with Kyle Lowry, who's going to be an attractive free agent? What's going to happen with Kelly Oubre, who turned out to be massively underpaid last season on the Sixers? They really need guys like that to come in. And we saw in Phoenix the diminishing returns when you have to go to bat every time with basically minimum salaries or bargain exceptions and where that can leave you as a team when you have to stack all those guys on top of each other. So... I think Drummond is a, is a great start, honestly. Like a good veteran backup. And not only that, but the kind of rebounder at the five, like an actual rebounder at the five who lets you play smaller at the four when you need to. So if Paul George is your full-time four or your part-time four, you can get away with stuff like that when you have a backup like Drummond who is going to step in for Embiid for a meaningful amount of time. 